Uh, so, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, see some faces I've seen before, but uh, most of you I have not. And I'm thinking that today that you want to hear things that are fairly practical. Um, now, that's a little bit of a challenge because I'm a guy who likes to sit in front of the computer and crank numbers and produce graphs and figures and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, I'm a cardiologist and I deal with real people. Um, oh, okay, sorry. Hmm. Test, test, test. Sorry, this is uh, problematic. Yeah. Testing one, two. All oh, right. Yeah. So um, at the same time, I, I'm a cardiologist and I deal with real people in the clinic with real problems like possibly some of you have. So I have to face some of these same issues. Um, but I'm not necessarily an expert in some of these practical things, but I'll do my best. What I know is a lot about the evidence that we ought to live our life in particular ways. And by the way, uh, Loma Linda, where I come from, is supposedly one of these blue zones, you know. And it's not so much because there are so many people living over 100 years of age, which was true in some places, although there's quite a lot in Loma Linda as well. But we looked at the issue of getting old successfully in a different way. We were more interested in moving the whole population up life expectancy by a number of years rather than leaving most of them untouched and just having a few that happen to get to over 100. And I'm not going to go uh, along with uh, 50 or 60 slides today. I've got many fewer and I'm going to try and kind of talk a little bit around the slides and uh, hopefully we can have a little interactive session at the end. So, first of all, what are the main causes of dying? Now, that's not a question that's a very happy one to contemplate, but uh, it's kind of what we're talking about today. And um, it, that varies a little bit in different communities. And in Southeast Asia, it might be a little different to what I'm used to, but uh, they, they are largely things such as cardiovascular disease. So what do we mean by that? It's when the heart goes wrong or there is high blood pressure. Um, and I thought I'd just take a minute or two and talk a little bit about what we mean, for instance, by heart attack. Because you're not all doctors or health professionals out here, I suppose. Um, the heart attack is when the little arteries about the size of a straw that are on the surface of the heart and feed the heart muscle with blood get blocked. And you know the heart is a massive muscle and the amount of energy it needs and the amount of power it produces roughly 60, 70, 80 times every minute for year after year, decade after decade, it needs to have a good supply of oxygen. And so these coronary arteries, of which there are three main ones, are so essential that they have a good flow of blood and oxygen and deliver it to that muscle that's working continuously all the time. You know, it only takes about five seconds if the heart stops and we lose consciousness. It's, isn't that amazing that it uh, keeps us going all these years? So. If those arteries get plugged up over the years with cholesterol and other fats and chemicals, uh, you can see that uh, that's going to cause a problem. And that's often manifested, uh, first of all, by chest pains when you work too hard, when you make your heart pump hard to keep the other muscles going and it's not getting its normal oxygen supply, well then it complains and you get this pain called angina. But if that artery actually gets totally blocked, then the muscle beyond that blockage will often die. And that's what we call a heart attack. And that can cause, uh, first of all, the heart to be weakened because some of its muscle is gone and it's replaced by a scar. But it can also cause the heartbeat to become irregular. And so we can get cardiac arrhythmias. And at their very worst, it can cause the heart to effectively stop 
electrically it's not stopping, but it could be that the heart is just kind of shimmering with waves racing around at ele electricity in a disorganized way. It's just like it stopped. And so that's what will cause sudden death in our community, uh, which is um, relatively common, at least in uh, most other Western communities. Then, of course, there's stroke as another cause of death. And that's a similar kind of thing, except it's not in your heart, it's in your brain, which is another one of those organs that just needs oxygen and blood flow continuously because the brain tissue, much of it, doesn't survive for very long once that is cut off. So if any of these arteries to the brain, even starting from the big carotid arteries in the neck, get blocked in the same way as the carotid arteries we were talking about, this can lead to a stroke. And uh, the way that you can recognize that uh, you've got a stroke coming on and sometimes you get some warning signs with what we call a TIA, transient ischemic attack. And uh, that can be things like you might lose your speech for a little bit, or your face might droop for a little bit, or you might get numbness in your face for a little bit, or your balance might go bad for a little bit. And so those are the kind of things you need to be aware of because sometimes this TIA, it might only last for half an hour and then come back, but it's a warning sign that things perhaps in the near future might be worse if that blockage becomes permanent and you do indeed end up with a stroke. So that's another cause of thing that causes people to die. And uh, sometimes strokes can be what we call hemorrhagic too, that the blood vessel bursts in the brain and then you can imagine that you've got high pressure blood going through the brain in places that shouldn't be, causing damage. <clears throat> Diabetes mellitus is uh, increasingly common, uh, I know, in the United States. And this is a condition that most of you are probably familiar with, that uh, many times people have to inject with uh, uh, insulin, not always, uh, some require pills only. And there are two main kinds. One is where the pancreas stops producing insulin altogether. And that's much less common, and that comes on often in children, and that's type, what we call type 1. And uh, insulin is a very important hormone because that controls the supply of glucose to uh, organs that need it, because glucose is actually the ultimate source of much of our energy that, that we uh, utilize from moment to moment. I'm utilizing as I stand up here, and utilizing as I try to think. The brain is a, uh, a major uh, utilizer of glucose, and insulin controls how much that glucose actually gets into the muscles and to the brain and so forth where it's needed, and at times how much is released from the liver because the liver is a storage area of glucose when the uh, amount in the blood goes a bit low then it'll be topped up. So insulin controls all that and one of the things that happens in people who get overweight and obese is that insulin stops working properly and there's all kind of chemistry underlying that but then the insulin is sometimes not stored properly in the liver or in the muscles where the storage happens also often as uh, something we call glycogen. And uh, if that doesn't happen, the pancreas responds for producing more and more. And after a time, that pancreas kind of burns out because it can no longer produce enough to keep the body's insulin requirement going. And that's what we call type 2 diabetes, that the pancreas keeps producing it although it may get a bit burned out at the end of the day, but the insulin just doesn't work uh, very well in a person who has an excess of adipose, what we call fatty tissue. The uh, next um, quite common cause uh, of dying is, of course, cancer, which you'll be very familiar with. And what is cancer? It's about 25 different things, but they have some common features. Um, but the causes of cancers in different organs are often different. Uh, so we need to keep that in mind. But at the end of the day, the cancer is a loss of control of 
the multiplication and the organization of cells in our body. Have you ever thought of the kind of wonderful thing it is that when a kidney is being formed, for instance, in a fetus or an embryo, uh, in a pregnant woman, how come the cells know to shape that organ like a bean and to kind of stop and not kind of produce a bump here and a bump there and so forth? It's a, a marvelous uh, thing. And it turns out that our cells do communicate with each other, but the language of communication is via a whole variety of chemicals, um, cytokines and hormones and tissue hormones and uh, IGFs and all kinds of things, uh, and many that we probably don't know about. So they have a chemical language that they actually talk to each other and control this. But that kind of goes haywire um, in cancer. And the DNA in each of our cells, as we know, they're little computers that are really DNA controlled that can make sure that all the chemistry is going on in balance in each one of our cells. Well, that goes wrong. The code that controls the chemistry in our cells goes wrong. So sometimes those cells don't know to stop dividing or they don't know that they've been badly damaged in some way and it's time for them to, to commit suicide. Cells do that, you know. We call it apoptosis. And uh, when that stops, you get, and it doesn't happen, you get highly abnormal cells that have been damaged in some way, perhaps by UV light by the sun or a number of other things, cigarette smoking in the lungs and uh, carcinogens there. And they've been really badly damaged, but they don't know they have, and they keep on dividing and the, their, their daughter cells that they produce are even worse damaged and so forth. And moreover, these cells lose the ability to stick together in that organ and they start to fly off in the blood and they can settle out in other places and that was what we call metastases and cause growing lumps there. And under the microscope, we can see that these cells are really very abnormal. So uh, that's cancer. Then people die of infectious diseases, don't they? Uh, 100, 150 years ago, they were the main causes of death, a little less now due to antibiotics and so forth. And uh, a lot of these are respiratory disease related, and that raises the question of COPD. That's kind of uh, emphysema and bronchitis and things like that, where the linings of our lungs, the little bronchioles and uh, the little tubes that conduct the oxygen are usually quite elastic, but their walls get damaged and they start to sag and the lung kind of expands and it doesn't contract in and out in the normal way as we breathe and so people become breathless. They can't pull the air in and out in the way that they normally can. And this can often lead to infections and pneumonia and things of that sort. Um, so, you know, infectious disease of course is a uh, a subject that you would want to take a half a year to learn all about and I'm not going to try and do that today. But uh, it turns out that uh, we can do something about the risk of that probably as well. So let me start, I've just got a few slides here that I'll uh, take kind of gently I think, um, I hope. Um, let's see if I know how to do this. Yes. So the study I've been working with is called the Adventist Health Study 2. And it's a study in California of Adventists. And you may, not, may or may not know, but Adventists are a little bit unique, not entirely unique amongst religions, in having uh, some, uh, having a real emphasis on health as a virtue. And more than that, it is recommended that Adventists are vegetarians, but it's not required. So, in fact, most of them are relatively low meat, but only about half them in the United States are actually vegetarian. So this sets up a very nice research possibility for people like me, that you can find a large number of people who live their life being vegans and lacto over vegetarians, that means they can have dairy and eggs, but not flesh foods or maybe only eat fish and we call them pesco vegetarians. And then we've got this other group of Adventists who are in fact meat eaters, relatively low meat in general, but they do eat meat. And so we can then look at the experience, the health experience of these people who live their life in different ways 
at least dietetically, even though they're all Adventists. Um, and so that's the basis of what we call a cohort study. And so we enrolled about 96,000 Adventists from all across the United States and gathered a lot of information about their diets at the beginning of the study, 2002 through 2007, then followed them up to see what would happen to them in terms of how long they lived, uh, whether they got cancer, what kind of cancer, whether they got heart disease and, and so forth. And so it was a great interest to us to look at whether there was a difference in longevity, and that's where I think our focus is to be today, um, between people who live their life in different ways. Uh, first of all, we looked at all Adventists in California, actually, for a start, and all non-Adventists in California, where mortality statistics were pretty easily available. And we had thousands of deaths in our um, Adventist cohort. Remember, we had 96,000 to start with, so they were dying about roughly 2% a year, uh, as it happens. And then we had, of course, hundreds of thousands of deaths in California as a whole to compare. And um, we found that um, the Adventists as a group were living, the men, about seven and a half years longer than their non-Adventist neighbors and the woman about four and a half years longer. So that's a big deal. That's a, a lot of time that um, one could potentially um, enjoy. So I'd like to um, just first of all, perhaps before I go to that slide, tell you that we then asked the question, even in our Adventist group, could you find differences? And indeed, we did find that there were things that predicted, even within our Adventist groups, some to live longer than others. And what were these? We found five things. And I would not say for a moment that these are the only five things that matter, but they were the ones that we could easily detect. And so I'm going to focus on them as we uh, go on today. Um, the first one was that the vegetarians did better by oh, roughly 15% or so. Um, interestingly, those who consumed nuts, small quantities on most days, five or six days a week, they did better, particularly from heart attack actually. But of course heart attack is one major cause of dying, so that uh, had its effect there as well. People who were overweight and Adventists, they didn't do as well. Um, you know, there's a bit of a myth out there that if you're older, you should carry a few more pounds and that's safer. It's not true in our data. Um, so that was number three. Be a vegetarian, nut consumer, be careful about your weight, not too light, not too <coughs> heavy. Never having been a smoker, most Adventists, in fact, nearly all Adventists uh, don't smoke, but there were those who were smokers before they became Adventists, so we could uh, look at them, of course. And, you know, that's kind of obvious to everyone, I think, these days. Back in the 1950s, by the way, it wasn't. And if you go back to the late 1940s and 1950s, there were all kinds of ads that, um, uh, for those that had bronchitis, smoke up more the soothing smoke to kind of ease the passage uh, of air to, to, to the lungs and so forth. I mean, ridiculous stuff uh, when you view it uh, from our perspective today. And the fifth one is uh, to engage in regular, vigorous physical activity as makes sensible for you and your lifestyle. So those are five things. Be a vegetarian, nut consumer, be careful with your body weight, never having been a smoker, and regular, vigorous physical activity, that each of them seemed to make a difference of about two years in life expectation. So if we looked at even the Adventists that did none of them properly, and then compared the Adventists that did all of them properly, and there were relatively few at these extremes, most were in the middle, but if we did that, we found a 10 year difference in life expectancy roughly two years from each of these five 
things. So what I'd like to do now is to go through and really talk about each of these five things uh, one at a time and then hopefully we'll have a little time for discussion. So first of all, why would it be that vegetarians do better? And we have uh, a number of things that we can talk about there. And this first slide is actually comparing all of these are Adventists, but these are the vegetarian Adventists and these are the non-vegetarian Adventists. And you can see this is the risk of coronary heart disease, dying of coronary heart disease. And so there's a significant difference there. And I'm not going to dwell on it, but um, that's important to note. If we look at a number of different cancers, and remember I said that the cancers were really not one disorder, they were a whole set of disorders that had some common features, but many different features. And if you see, if we look here at different cancers, comparing <coughs> the rate at different amounts of meat being consumed, this being related to vegetarian status, of course, we can see that colon cancer, not so clearly prostate cancer, this was not, this could have been due to chance that we found these differences. Ovarian cancer, um, and particularly if they were postmenopausal, and also bladder cancer, that we found some fairly clear evidence of differences. Um, now, I might say that uh, our later work um, also looked at um, different kinds of vegetarian, and I don't think I'll go into that in a major way. Those that, for instance, are vegans who have no animal products at all, um, they had a lower risk of both prostate and breast cancer compared to all the others together. And uh, that raises some questions about dairy and dairy milk as well. Whether you should be a vegan vegetarian or a lacto-over vegetarian is a complicated question. And let me just say that I think the, to summarize our evidence, I would do it like this that you're best off to be a low dairy, zero dairy milk, lacto ovo vegetarian, which means a bit of cheese or maybe some yogurt is okay. At this moment, there's a question over dairy milk, and I think it's safest to perhaps exclude it. We've got a lot of different choices in various vegetable milks. So, um, it turns out that the vegans do well, very well, in cardiovascular disease and certain cancers, prostate and breast, but not so well in others. And overall, um, I would not necessarily stipulate that a vegan is the best way to go, but a low dairy, like uh, over vegetarian would be my choice, and perhaps the occasional fish. Um, so, if we think about vegetarianism and cardiovascular disease, and first of all, risk factors for cardiovascular disease that include also diabetes here and high blood pressure. And you can see that these are the vegans and these are the non-vegetarians. These are the pescos that eat a little fish. And these are the lacto-ovo vegetarians. I think my pointer has just died for some reason. <laughs> Um, maybe it's because I'm talking about dying, I don't know, but um, anyhow, as you can see that there's quite a progression in risk of high blood pressure, hypertension, as one passes from being a vegan to a non-vegetarian. And the same thing is true here when we look at type 2 diabetes, that there's about a threefold difference in risk between um, being a vegan, but even being any kind of vegetarian and being a non-vegetarian, which is the far right bar. And also it affects cholesterol. Mm, I think maybe my whole um, pointer, uh, my whole thing has died here. I can't advance the slide either. <laughs> Uh, I think I'm deaf to these things. I had this trouble. I was talking in Penang last week, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm pointing it in the wrong place. But uh, 
Yeah. Maybe up there. Okay. Yeah. Well, what I'm going to show you um, coming up is we've just looked at diabetes, and I can tell you that chronic renal failure, dying from chronic renal failure, is much, much lower in the vegetarian Adventists than the non vegetarian Adventists. About two thirds lower. Um, and dying from infectious disease is also somewhat lower in our vegetarian Adventists. So we know that being a vegetarian has many advantages and uh, we have some idea of why this happens. Vegetarians have lower cholesterols, they have lower blood pressures as you've just seen. Um, they have less inflammation if we look at a chemical called CRP and inflammation is uh, <laughs> an underlying factor in um, uh, many of these causes of death, such as cancer and heart disease. Uh, they also have an, an effect on insulin as well. The vegetarians require less insulin to be effective, partly because of the lower weight. So practically speaking, if you want to change your life to become a vegetarian, uh, how do you do that? Um, people are different and it depends on their circumstances of course and some people have to take the perspective of being a low meat consumer first of all and being comfortable with that and then gradually sliding down into becoming uh, someone who has no red meats at least and preferably even poultry at all or just once in a very great while and the nice thing is that some people believe that vegetarians kind of must eat only lettuce and carrots and occasional beans, but in truth, there is a tremendous variety of very tasty vegetarian foods and products, if you know how. And I think it's going to be perhaps part of this course to uh, help you um, get access to some of those things, because you need the skills, a little bit of skill to do it. Uh, you also need the social support and uh, for those of you who are married to get your spouse on board is uh, a really big help or to have others in your family who may help you to do this um, but it's entirely doable and uh, I've been a vegetarian for most of my life I have tasted meat don't miss it not important to me uh, at all so the second thing that we talked about was nuts and um, heart disease and um, I'll go on um, okay so um, at the back he's going to advance it I've actually passed this now so why don't we go to the next one thank you yeah nuts and heart disease so let's go to the next and here you can see uh, actually from one of our previous studies of about 34,000 people this was really surprising to us back in the mid-1990s, because nuts are a fatty food. And everyone back there knew that fatty foods were bad. But it turns out that all fats aren't equal, and that there are saturated fats, and monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated, and the fats in nuts are mono, and in walnuts are polyunsaturated. And we now have now come to understand that these lower blood cholesterol. They also uh, have a high content of the amino acid arginine and we know that that also does good things in terms of reducing inflammation and also helping to lower blood cholesterol. Um, so it's no great surprise that some of these nuts um, were, uh, in fact nearly all the nuts it turns out were related to a lower risk of heart disease particularly. Um, now, whether you might say uh, which nut, and some, in some places nuts are more expensive than others, and you may need to consider that. Uh, it turns out that most of the common nuts, walnuts, almonds, pistachios, and uh, even peanuts actually, even though they're botanically a little different, they're actually a legume, but nutrient-wise they're actually very similar. Um, now, as I always say, it's not we're advocating sitting with a bucket of nuts in front of the TV and kind of because nuts are easy to do that. It's a small handful every day. 
uh, and they do not make people fat when you do that. We've uh, we've looked at that, and uh, that's very interesting. But it's it's a it's a, a fact. Um, okay, thanks. Good. <coughs> Oh, I think it worked. Um, so just to show you that we actually were able to cut the population in about 18 different ways. And um, here we can see that, oh yeah, um, even if we look at the vegetarians and the non-vegetarians separately, that the high nut eating vegetarians did better for heart attack than the low nut. Uh, nut eating vegetarians and the non vegetarians the same thing and whether we looked at men whether we looked at women whether we looked at those that exercised and those that didn't and wh whatever subgroups we looked at we just found this nut consumption effect uh, was always there so the third thing I wanted to talk about in terms of helping us oh yeah um, live long and is was body weight and uh, mortality now, uh, is being heavy a good thing or a bad thing? Oh. Why don't you just say a one slide you're doing? I'm not sure we should point okay. it. <laughs> you press the wrong button. Okay. Oh. All right. Thanks. Um, oops, <coughs> we need, need to go back. Um, okay, thank you. That, that's good, actually. So we're, we've um, seen slides like this already before. And you can see that uh, as you go from the vegans to the lactose to the pescos and to the right, the non-vegetarians, for an average height woman, there's about a 30 pound, that's what, about 14K or something like that, difference in weight. And the same thing exactly uh, for the men, although the men were on average heavier, of course. Um, so this um, tells us that um, we do have some control over our body weight just by the choice of diet that we make. Um, next slide, thank you. And um, here is a look at the relationship between the hazard ratio for death, which being interpreted means the risk of dying at any particular BMI level, now BMI is a measure of obesity or overweight. So you can see as it gets higher and higher, these are fatter and fatter people. And you can see the lowest risk for both the men and the women is for a BMI uh, really under uh, 26 or 7 for women and more like 22 or 23 for the men. And after that, it keeps rising. And the interesting thing was that um, as people got older and older in our study, we found that this curve didn't change very much. So uh, that's, that's uh, an interesting statistic. And this was in uh, black subjects, uh, where actually this is a slide that just looks at what I told you, that at different ages, um, these were people that were uh, heavier, BMI as high as 34 or better, and so their risk of dying went up at earlier ages than these people out here who were thinner people, and at different ages um, their BMI had different impact. Okay, so how could uh, BMI do such wonderful things to uh, living longer. Um, in other words, people who are heavy, they have a higher risk of dying. Well, no big surprise, because we've already talked about one of these things. People who are overweight are more likely to get diabetes, which is a common cause of death. People that are overweight are more likely to be hypertensive, high blood pressure. Uh, some people call adipose tissue, that's fatty tissue in our body, the organ of inflammation. In other words, it is the adipocytes, which are the cells that contain all this fat, that are also the same cells that are releasing chemicals that cause inflammation in the body. And uh, one common chemical that's produced by the liver 
uh, called CRP, if you look at it in overweight people, it's considerably higher generally than those who are thinner. So uh, inflammation is a potent cause of cancer, but also artery disease and heart disease and stroke. And so uh, keeping a careful body weight is uh, obviously going to be helpful. We also know that body weight is a risk factor for not only heart attack, which uh, is no surprise, but also for a number of cancers. Cancer of a woman's womb, the endometrial, cancer of the large bowel, colorectal, cancer of the stomach, cancer of the liver, cancer of the bladder, cancer of the prostate. And all these cancers, being overweight, doesn't dramatically increase risk, but it does so importantly, maybe 10-15%. Um, so no wonder that uh, being overweight is a risk factor. So from a practical perspective, how do you lose weight? Well, that's, uh, the person who has that secret is a multi-millionaire, isn't he? But uh, there are many things we know. One of them we've shown you already. You choose to become a vegetarian, mostly you will lose weight. Not everybody, but on average, remember there was that kind of 30 pound span there for most people. Uh, there are other things that you can do. So choosing a plant-based diet preferentially is gonna be helpful. That's, that's one, one way. Secondly, we found in our work, and now it's been confirmed by others, that if you have a longer fast at night time between the last time you eat in the afternoon or evening and your breakfast, if it's like 14 hours or so, with no snacking in between, then over decades of time, you put on less weight. Uh, people don't tend to get that little pot belly and so forth as they get older. Um, that 20 pounds or so that uh, you can um, have an effect on there is another. Then there are practical things like eat slowly. The person who finishes their meal first uh, in a consistent way is more likely to be the overweight person uh, in your house, in your household. Enjoy your food, chew, chew your food well, and that actually um, decreases the appetite, increases what we call satiety, a feeling of fullness and satisfaction with what you're eating. And secondly, be careful with your portion sizes. You see, industry out there is not on your side. You go to the restaurant, they like to give you twice as much as you need because then they can charge you uh, a sufficient amount. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, and so, again, if you are going out with someone, think about sharing uh, sometimes. Uh, particularly in the United States, this is a problem, but I have been very well fed, very well fed. Uh, in uh, Singapore in the last few days and uh, uh, I think the portion sizes are often more than is necessary here uh, as, as well in many cases so keep that in mind. The fourth thing was never being a smoker and I'm not going to say much about that because I don't think much is necessary to say. Everyone knows about smoking and lung cancer but did you know that smoking of course is the most common cause of uh, chronic bronchitis, and emphysema, uh, respiratory failure. Uh, it's also a potent cause of heart attacks, particularly in young people. It's interesting, a younger person in their 30s and 40s who's a smoker has about a fourfold risk as compared to a non-smoker in their 40s and 50s. By the time you get to 60, 70, 80, they only have about a one and a half fold risk. Um, so it's those premature deaths that smokers are putting themselves at risk of. And then there's a number of cancers that are related to smoking, of course lung cancer we know, but also cancer of the mouth and the pharynx and particularly for the lip pipe smoking, uh, esophagus, stomach, pancreas. Um, so um, smoking of course is just poison uh, for most people. Uh, let's just uh, not use any other words, that's the way it is. And the fifth one was regular, vigorous physical activity. 
Now you don't need to run marathons to uh, get big advantage. Um, by the way, if you want to lose weight, people sometimes just say, okay, I'm gonna go on an exercise program. And most people, that alone will fail. Um, what is more effective is the dietary approach but exercise is a very good add-on to that. But exercise by itself generally will, will fail. So bear that in mind, it's really got to be a combined approach for most people, unless you're going to run marathons. But um, So back to physical activity itself. Um, we um, know that that is related to a number of risk factors, uh, obesity being one of them. Uh, blood pressure being another, uh, because of its effect in obesity, it is also you're less likely to be diabetic. Um, and also, it helps the body use energy more efficiently. Uh, the little organelles within our cells that produce energy are called mitochondria. It helps them to be more efficient in their use of energy. So if you do get a partial blockage in the artery, you're more likely to survive it because the heart muscle is being more efficient in the way it can use that reduced supply of oxygen. So exercise doesn't necessarily take the blockage away in the same way as diet does, but it makes the blockage less lethal. Um, exercise, by the way, is related to a number of cancers as well as heart disease, uh, colorectal, breast, bladder, uh, kidney, gastric, um, and it also uh, in decreases inflammation, which is relevant to both, as I keep saying, both cancers and heart attack. So practically, how do you get involved in a physical activity program? Well, that's tough, isn't it? But not so tough. The most important thing is to make that transition from being a couch potato to having, you know, a small amount of activity at least five days a week, not necessarily every day. Uh, by the time you've got a, uh, a good amount of activity going, whether it's a vigorous walk, which is just fine, could be cycling, could be swimming, uh, it could be calisthenics in a number of different ways. And you know, ideally, it's good to be doing about 45 minutes a day, four or five times a week. That should be the goal for most people, but uh, you've got to take it gradually in many cases and you've got to be persistent and give yourself little rewards if you can join a club, if you can make friends that are doing it and you can buy a dog and have to take them walking every day, uh, that's a good way to do it as, as well. So I think that's um, most of what I wanted to say and I will just um, finish off with two or three slides that mainly relate to nutrition because I think it's important for many people because uh, it's often very unclear how one should live if you just read the newspaper. Uh, things vary from day to day or week to week it seems. So it is a tough science, nutritional science, and so you need to be very careful even those of us who are professionals need to be very wary of the traps in interpreting the data. It's not that the data is wrong, but it's how it's interpreted that can be wrong. So the best thing to do is to follow the preponderance from high quality studies. Now that's tough for a layman to do. How do you know whether they're high quality? But if they come from major universities and if they're published in important journals like the New England Journal and uh, JAMA and BMJ and things like that, they're more likely to be high quality studies. But be kind of skeptical of writings that you might get in popular books, uh, even from someone who has an MD or a PhD, that's not enough in my opinion. They really need to be active researchers that are publishing in the literature and, and they are then become aware of all these traps in interpreting the data. And finally, if they're selling a nutritional product, my word, don't take much notice of what they say many times. Now, some of these people might be saying 80 or 90% of things which are okay. Uh, generally, there's some, some issues in there which uh, most of us would take, uh, make some objection to. Um, 
And lastly, if I wanted to just be very simple about the way that I think we should be eating, it would be to prefer a plant-based diet, but also to be sure that you do not have a diet that may majors in highly processed foods. In other words, it's possible to be a vegetarian and still have a very bad diet. So you want to have as many natural foods as you can. Not that all processed foods are bad, but a diet that majors in processed foods is something to be avoided. The evidence is quite clear on that. So I think I'll stop there, Eric, and um, maybe we've got a little time. I think I've gone a little longer than I should have, actually. But um, <clears throat> All right, thank you, Dr. Fraser. Anyone has uh, questions pertaining to uh, today's topic, especially the five items that was being mentioned uh, for what, uh, 10 years to your life? Can you recall what are the five items? No oh, No smoking, yes. Exercise. Exercise. Eat nuts. Eat nuts. Maintain a healthy weight. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Any specific questions that we may have? Anyone? Don't be shy. Yes, there's one here. Right. Pass the mic to you. Mm. Hi, Dr. Fraser. What are your thoughts on alcohol? Yes. Alcohol. Right. Good, good question. Sorry, I didn't see you people over here before, but um, I'm pleased you're there. Um, well, you know, alcohol has been examined backwards and forwards and up and down many, many times. We know that it's a risk factor for a number of um, important disorders, which are not all that uncommon. Um, we know that about 10 or 15 percent of people will lose control of alcohol and uh, will abuse alcohol. Uh, many of those will come at risk of um, cirrhosis of the liver. Um, and my practice at Loma Linda University as a cardiologist, one of the things we are often asked to do is to um, do a preoperative evaluation on people that are being set up for a liver transplant. And many of those are people that have abused alcohol. Um, there's a little bit of still controversial evidence after 20 or 30 years as to whether alcohol might be mildly protective for heart disease, uh, particularly coronary disease. Um, so, you know, my, my point would be that even if that is true, and it's very debatable, and there's points for and against, and it's only a mild effect, that I don't think it makes any difference. We should um, not, as public health professionals, ever advocate the use of alcohol because it's related to the risk of a number of different cancers, uh, breast cancer being one of them, um, and uh, and also it's it's related also to so many social ills. Uh, motor vehicle accidents, uh, marital disruption, violence in the home, that uh, whatever mild in benefits it may have or may not have, I think are heavily outweighed by the other things that it doesn't do. Um, so that would probably be what I have to say about that. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Anyone else? Okay. Mm. Right. Uh, you say smoking is quite um, bad. So what about those who don't smoke, but they get secondhand from other people on a consistent basis? Yeah. Um, yeah. That well, that that's that's um, not trivial. Uh, and we now have increasing evidence, I think, that people that, for instance, are in a household maybe with a spouse who's smoking uh, will sometimes be at risk of some of these same disorders. It's not quite as potent, but it can be pretty bad. 
Uh, I can remember as a medical student that uh, we had to go and attend a uh, Alcoholics Anonymous session just for our learning, you know. And one thing that a lot of people who are alcohol abusers do, they've often been smokers at the same time, and they find it interestingly easier to give up alcohol and cigarettes. So you go along to these meetings, and, and half of them are smoking, and you know, I remember there was one guy that was sitting across the aisle from me who was smoking a big cigar, and he would puff out a big ring of smoke, and the air was such that it would come and come right across my, my face, which I had hold my breath for a, a few minutes. So, you know, secondhand smoke. Um, my mother actually died of a respiratory disease eventually. She was a reasonable age, but her father, when she was a child, had been a smoker, and quite a heavy smoker. He died uh, uh, with some uh, bronchitis and that as well. But so I, I think that there, you know, so that, that's just a few kind of personal anecdotes, but there is evidence now from many different sources that secondhand smoke is, uh, is a factor to be taken into account for heart attack and maybe some cancers. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Has yeah. there been any lengthy studies yeah. on... We'll just wait for the mic, Sorry. probably. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, thank yeah. you for your presentation mm -hmm. today. Um, yeah. I just wanted to ask about gut health, if I could. Yes. Um, yeah. Two years ago, I had an accident where I needed surgery. Within right. a year, I had two surgeries, and of course, there were pain meds and all that sort of thing. And, yeah. Um, I, under the general anesthesia and all that. Coming out of that, I had really difficult bowel movement issues where, like, three days. You know, yeah. I, you know, well, that kind of thing. I'm much right. better now, right. two years on. Right. But my question to you is, um, what would be the best way? Because it's not completely back to normal yet. And so my question is, what would be the best mm. way to restore my gut health? Um, I know there are probiotics, and prebiotics, mm. and yeah. uh, things like that. But uh, maybe on a, a natural food basis. With, uh, and maybe address probiotics yeah. as well. Yes, yeah, so I don't feel entirely confident to address that. I am a heart doctor. Yeah. Um, but um, it is true that the way we eat can make a, have some impact on the uh, gut bacteria, which may be related to your question. Um, Following a surgery like that, it's very common to have um, um, the bowel become somewhat paralyzed for a time, but it usually comes right by itself. Um, ha have you talked to a gastroenterologist about this? I mean, in terms of um, gut health, probably the best I can say there is um, a, a good amount of fiber is usually good for that. It won't necessarily uh, cure the problem, but uh, you can even get fiber supplements, as you probably know, um, which may or may not be effective. Um, there, there are products that are not kind of natural that you can get, uh, like Aerolax now. I've forgotten what the chemical name of that is, but it's pretty benign and you can put it in that just kind of uh, moves things along a little better. But, um, you know, I don't feel very adequate to address that question, but um, we, have, we have looked at the bowel bacteria in our vegetarians as compared to our non-vegetarians, and interestingly find some minor differences in which species of bacteria. We do not find a lot of difference in the diversity of the bacteria between vegetarians and non-vegetarians, which is something that people like to measure. I don't know that that's the best measure, actually. But um, physical activity is also um, known to impact bowel flora, and I think also bowel uh, regularity sometimes. So that's something else worth considering, I think. Uh, the other thing to consider is adequate hydration. Many people find actually that if you make sure you drink your four, five, six glasses of water a day, that um, just being hydrated can make quite a significant difference. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah.
Um, well, I wouldn't say that there's evidence to recommend it, but we've never found evidence that was compelling against it. Um, and even though we find pretty good evidence against, at the moment, dairy milk from the perspective at least of two cancers, not necessarily total mortality, we haven't really looked at that, but there, there's some, you know, dairy milk is under question let me put it that way, um, and if you have a family history or a personal history of breast cancer or um, prostate cancer, I would be particularly reluctant to have much uh, dairy milk. Um, but, um, yeah, so I mean, I think that's pretty much what I could say about that. Mm. On, uh, between the let go and the press go, the finding seems a bit interesting. If you were to look at that, yeah. So if I look at the CRP, the one press go seems to be higher. Whereas if I look at the fasting <laughs> insulin, insulin, the press go seems to be better. So is eating fish? How does eating fish? Uh, affect this. Uh, right. Well, well um, the, the PESCO there, uh, the higher the bar, the more inflammation. So the PESCO is not better there, it's higher. Yeah. Um, but I would say those two, the yellow and the blue bar, are so close together that I couldn't make it. In other words, if we were to do the study again, we might find easily that that is reversed and it's just. <laughs> chance. It's, it's not a big enough difference to say for sure that it's real. Let me put it that way. But your, your bigger question is, is there a difference between vegans and lactose and pescos in terms, say, of total mortality even? And it turns out that in our data, the pescos and the lactose are doing best of all. The vegans not quite as good but all of them are doing better than the non-vegetarians. So, <laughs> so adding the fish in the diet is actually the way it's A little bit of fish, I think there's evidence, is certainly not a bad thing and might be helpful. Mm. Uh, it does contain, uh, you know, if you particularly use the fatty fishes, some. Um, long chain omega-3 fatty acids, which uh, there's some question mark where the vegans get so little of that that maybe that's a problem. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yes. I, mm. I got a question. Yes. Uh, in your study, you didn't study the effect of caffeine on cardiovascular health. Is yeah. there some correlation? Um, not really. Um, there's and coffee, and if you, I mean caffeine's a little different to coffee, but coffee contains is probably the place where we get easily most caffeine. It contains some uh, organic oils that will increase blood cholesterol, and it seems like, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I guess you weren't there perhaps, but uh, the other day that uh, in Scandinavia, where they have what they call boiled coffee that I think the whole bean is kind of in there. And back in the 1990s, there were a lot of studies in Scandinavia that showed higher heart attack rates with coffee. But in the United States and other parts of the world, no one could ever duplicate that. And I think it's because the coffee is prepared differently and is filtered and those oils come out. The effect of caffeine itself on coronary artery disease, I don't think there's any evidence that there is. Uh, a very large amount of caffeine, six or seven cups of coffee a day may do it, may cause the heart to speed up and even give it a little irregularity. But even that is not as important as we used to think. Um, so, yeah. yeah, we'll probably communicate quite well. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, you've given us some extremely valuable uh, statistics based on your studies. Mm. Um, one of the concerns I have is mm. the future generations. If uh, a mother mm. is pregnant, yeah. is drinking or drinking and smoking during the entire pregnancy period, has yeah. that ever been studied at depth? And then on the other side of the equation, if the husband, the man who's contributed to that little child, um, with his sperm, yeah. if he drinks and smokes, does that have any adverse effect? Uh, yeah. I would have thought they would have, yeah. um, but I don't know if there's any studies done. Right. Because that's vital. Yeah, I mean, that, that, those are very interesting questions. And interestingly, I did a little study on that when I was a medical student, but never published it. And as far as I could tell, yeah, well, I was looking at congenital effects mm. in the child, would the child be born with some abnormalities? And um, I did seem to find evidence that that was true for, for both when the father or the mother were, were doing, yeah. doing these things. Um, there, there's been quite a bit of study done on um, fetal effects of, say, malnutrition and smoking, I think. And um, some of these have been natural experiments, like after the Second World War where there were countries like the Netherlands at uh, times that really were um, almost in famine conditions and uh, there, there are a lot of children being born at that time. They tend to gain overweight more as they get older. They tend to have more diabetes and more hypertension uh, when the mother was malnourished. Now, in terms of maternal smoking, I'm sure there is evidence out there, but I just don't have that on the top of my head at the moment. But it's an and interesting and question. The alcohol side as well. And the al well, of course, yeah. alcohol has been well studied, and there's a condition called fetal alcohol syndrome, which is yeah. well known and well studied. Yeah. And uh, the children there often are very difficult to manage, uh, yeah. have some intellectual deficits. Because yeah. there is a yeah. high percentage of mm. children being born mm. with a variety of deficiencies and I often think, well, is that because of what happened during that pregnancy period? Yes, so yes. So it must contribute. I, I think there is right. That, you know, that there are all kinds of things that you can know, I mean in the United States, and I don't know how it is here, there's a, a lot of drug abuse, amphetamines and things like that. And uh, I think there's also good evidence that kids that are born to mothers who are abusing drugs are uh, also likely to have a variety of deficits. Uh, many of them are intellectual or emotional yeah. as they grow up. Yeah. I don't know if anyone in Singapore knows mm. about the KK mm. Hospital, which is mm. dedicated totally to mm. mothers and babies. Whether yeah. they've done any studies on it at all, that would yeah. be an yeah. interesting one. Yeah, I don't special. know whether there's anyone else here in the audience who has any better information that I can give on that. But, um, no, no, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 it's possible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Do vegetarians and lacto-vegetarians have a higher risk of developing osteoporosis? Yeah, good question. Um, I didn't really talk about bone health, did I? Um, there's a little evidence actually that uh, vegans are at higher risk. And um, I think there are ways that they have of um, potentially overcoming that. Um, and our data actually, and in uh, the data from most studies, calcium in the diet is not important. Isn't that interesting? Unless it's very low, in which you will get some problems. But the difference between a normal calcium and a higher calcium is not there. You, you don't find it. So what are the things that are important? Um, it appears that to have an adequate protein intake, and whether it's plant-based or whether it's vegetable-based protein doesn't make a lot of difference. We've published data on that. And secondly, to make sure you're getting good physical activity um, that helps your bone health. Yeah, and uh, you know, good, good exposure to sunlight as well because you, most of you probably know that vitamin D really is made by your skin. But it's also true that as you get older, your skin doesn't work as well. So uh, there's maybe a place for supplementing with vitamin D, or that, though that also has become controversial. It's not quite so clear as it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I seem to hear you saying either plant-based or vegetable-based protein, it doesn't make a difference. What about yeah. meat-based? Um, 
Well, the, the, I'm sorry, I said, did I say plant or yeah. vegetable? I, I didn't mean that. I, I meant animal or vegetable. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. Um, yeah, so, so we looked at that uh, in our data and uh, seemed kind of equivalent that was uh, the protein. You don't want to have too much protein, of course, that's bad for your kidneys, but uh, to have 70, 80, 85 grams a day is, uh, should be adequate. The physical activity, in protein, and that's about as good as you do. Make sure you get adequate calcium. It's not difficult to get calcium from plant sources, of course. Yeah. 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 Uh, for instance, yeah. how safe are eggs? Eggs. eggs. How safe are eggs? Um, we've never ever found a bad signal with eggs for the cancers or the heart disease, and other people have not found it for heart disease either. <laughs> They've looked at quite quite a lot. Um, and, you know, eggs are a very good source of protein. Of course, the yolk is a very high source of cholesterol. Well, you might say, whoa. Um, but it turns out, interestingly, that the cholesterol that you eat, most of that doesn't get into the blood as cholesterol. The, most of the cholesterol in your blood comes from what your liver makes. And most of the cholesterol you eat is kind of broken down. Um, so it's much more important actually the saturated fat that you eat because that is a kind of a stimulus to the liver to make cholesterol in the blood. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, the monounsaturated and particularly the polyunsaturated fats act somewhat in the opposite direction and tend to lower cholesterol. So the saturated fat nearly always animal fat, although coconut fat and palm oil, oil has quite a lot of saturated fat. It has some polyunsaturated, some unsaturated as well, but it's not a particularly good ratio. Um, cancer, linked to cancer, in any way? Um, eggs, uh, we've never found that, and I don't think there's much others who, uh, who have found that either. No. I, I mean, I think you don't want to major in eggs. Uh, you know, you don't want to have six eggs a day. Um, you're going to be in trouble. But the occasional egg, probably fine. <laughs> What's your take on um, coconut oil? There's a great yeah. controversy on that. Yeah, well, I kind of almost regret having mentioned coconut oil. The, the, the <laughs> uh, because I, I don't think the, the answer is there. The thing about it is coconut oil is saturated, but it's what we call a shorter chain saturated fat. Um, the medium chain that we know are bad for cholesterol are 12, 14, 16 carbons. Most of the coconut fat is fewer carbons, shorter chain. And, uh, you know, there's been some hype out there in the popular literature at least that maybe coconut fat is kind of helpful and uh, good stuff. All I can tell you is that my professor when I was at medical school many years ago used to feed his rats coconut fat in order to give them heart attacks so um, I'm a little dubious uh, about uh, coconut fat particularly seeing it's a saturated fatty acids whether it's a short chain really makes that difference there's been only a limited amount of good research on that, unfortunately, so the answer is not totally clear. Yeah. 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 Is, is it true that, um, that too much protein in your, di in your diet um, will cause the body to throw off calcium? I've heard that. Is that, is that true? Yeah, I think there is some truth to that. Um, and, you know, that, that's another reason why you really don't want to have a keto diet, for instance, or, you know, one of these, what are they, paleolithic, yeah. paleo diets, so forth. Uh, I mean, some of those diets do actually acutely help you lose weight, there's no question about that. But you're probably still going to die of a heart attack because it's bad stuff you're eating, even though you're thin. <laughs> so, um, not to be recommended, I don't think. What, what would be too much protein then in that case? Well, I certainly would, you know, it depends a little bit on your size, of course. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, anything above, I think about 90 grams is more than you need in a day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Mm. The place, uh, uh, mm. I have a friend who, uh, like every morning, she will drink like five to eight cups of water at one time. Is that normal and is that good? At one time? Mm. What, and several times a day? No, she just forces herself to do it in the morning. I see, and then none in the afternoon. No, I mean she will drink, but that is a must that she practice. Is that normal? Is that good for the health? Well, you, you, you know, it, it, anything's a poison if you use it in the wrong way. Yeah. And you can, there is such a thing medically as water intoxication, and it actually, you get swelling of the brain and it can be really bad. But, you know, five or six cups a day won't do it. Um, even up to seven or eight cups a day is not going to cause you a problem, except that you need to go to the bathroom a lot, you know. But, um, Any other? Last call, last call. Yes, Michelle? Hi, hi Doctor. Mm. You mentioned that it's good to eat nuts, right? So, uh, does it mean that you must eat raw nuts or is it all nuts raw in the same room? Well, I think so. Most of the nuts that I'm aware of. Um, even roasted is probably okay because there's evidence that most of the oil that they might be roasted in doesn't stick to the nut much because nuts are hard. But you know, once you get to them being coated in sugar and all that kind of thing, I, I wouldn't go for that. You know. <laughs> Raw is good. Yeah. 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 Hello. Um, I have a question about cancer and vegetarianism because there seems to be such a high incidence of cancers, even if one is incredibly healthy. And um, anecdotally, you know, I, I just hear of more and more people um, coming yeah. down with cancer despite yeah. this healthy lifestyle and being vegetarian right. or vegan. Right. Yeah. Well, um, and that's kind of true. The thing is that if you look at all cancers together, the vegetarians are doing a little bit better. But you've really got to pull the cancers apart to the different kinds of cancer because it turns out that they, the vegans particularly are doing well for um, breast and prostate, about 30% lower, and probably some others as well. But the um, vegans are not doing quite as well for colorectal. Um, and there are a lot of the cancers where your vegetarian or non-vegetarian dietary habits don't make much difference. So overall, if you put all the cancers together, there is about a 10 to 15% reduction in risk. But you think about what that means. It means that 85% of the cancers that were ever going to happen if you're a non-vegetarian are still going to happen if you're a vegetarian. So, being a vegetarian is not a cure for cancer. Yeah, yeah. All right, any more last questions? Let, let, let me just say one other thing kind of that spins out of that a little bit. What does a good lifestyle do? It doesn't make you die of different things, like there was you know, a cure for cancer, for instance. <coughs> The vegetarians in our group are dying of all the same things, but they're dying seven, eight years later. So it's actually taking care of premature deaths to some extent and giving more people that are, are still available to enter the 80s, for instance. So a few of them are going to go on and enter their hundreds as well. But that's not been our focus, as I mentioned earlier. <coughs>